All right, chemists, today we are going to go over nuclear equations. So we have a little better idea after the last lecture what nuclear energy is and what nuclear reactions are. Now we're going to look at some kinds of equations that are the most common. So let's remind ourselves about what a chemical reaction is. Anything that we do in this classroom is either a physical or chemical change. In general, physical changes involve a very little exchange of energy. An example of a physical change would be um, brewing coffee. You're not changing anything about it, really. You're just combining two things. Cutting anything into smaller pieces, like you saw me cutting those copper turnings into smaller pieces. That's a physical change. And here's the one that confuses people a lot of times is like melting of ice because you're not really changing it. It's still just H2O. Those are physical changes and those involve a relatively small amount of energy. A chemical change is what a chemical reaction we, we would do in the lab, which you've seen me do. All of the demos I've done for you are chemical changes. Those involve a, more energy relatively speaking, not always, but um, a, more than a physical change. And then it comes to nuclear reactions. Nuclear reactions combine or decay atoms to form more stable nuclear arrangements, meaning the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. So oftentimes radiation is produced, new elements are formed, and lots of energy is released. So relatively speaking, the most amount of energy is released by nuclear changes. In all of these things, though, mass, charge, and energy are all conserved. So it's going to be the same thing we did when we balanced chemical equations. You're going to have reactants on the left-hand side of the yield sign products on the right-hand side of the yield sign. So the sum of the atomic numbers, which is the bottom numbers, have to be the same on the, both sides. That's law of conservation of charge. The mass numbers, the top numbers, have to be the same also due to the law of conservation of mass. So you guys should be on your flowchart. Notice I did leave you some space at the bottom where you can take notes on how to do this. So here's an example of a nuclear equation. This is called a fusion equation. Notice the top has 14 for nitrogen and four for helium. That adds up to 18. So the top number has to add up and the bottom number also has to add up. So let's take a look at this. Let's say we're missing our other re product here. This is what this is saying. So when uranium naturally decays, I know it's a natural decay because there's one reactant, we are going to release a alpha particle. So you can see the alpha particle provides four for the top mass number. So the mass number of the missing particle has to be 30, 238 minus 4. The bottom number has 92 for uranium. The alpha particle has 2 already, so the bottom must be 92 minus 2. That's the charge number. That's the atomic number. What element are we talking about? So once we identify that bottom number, we can identify the identity of the missing product, and that's TH. That's the identity. Remember the Z number is the number of protons. That Z number is going to identify what we're talking about. So that's how we do this. If you're looking for an element, then you're going to look on the periodic table of the elements. If you're looking for a particle, you're going to look in our list of particles. So let's talk about the particles that are going to be involved in these nuclear equations. 
This is not a comprehensive list of particles. There's also other kinds of particles called positrons, which is a positive electron. There's all sorts of other rays that are emitted. But these are the ones that we're going to see the most, and these are the ones that we're going to be responsible for. We know alpha, beta, gamma from our previous lecture, and we know a neutron from our beginning of the year when we went across subatomic particles. So let's go over a few definitions. Radioactive decay is a natural decay or release of particles. You can identify it because it always has one reactant and it will have more than one product. When we say releasing a particle, the word we're referring to is emission. It is a product. It is on the right-hand side of the yield sign. If it was a reactant, it would be called a projectile that we're shooting at it. But if it's a particle on the right-hand side, it's being emitted. These are two words that can be confusion. Fission and fusion can be confusing. Fission is the splitting of a large nuclei by bombardment or shooting projectiles to produce medium-sized nucleides. Fission is what we do in nuclear power plants and what happens in nuclear bombs. Fusion is the uniting or union of small, smaller nucleides into something bigger. So have the I in fission remind you of the I in splitting. Have the U in fusion remind you of the U in unite and the U in sun, because the fusion is what happens in the sun. So we haven't particularly mastered fusion yet. It, it, we can't control it. It's um, too costly and too dangerous and all that kind of stuff. So if you ever decide you want to go into nuclear chemistry, there's still a lot of work to be got done as far as trying to harness the energy stored in nucleuses, which is, or nuclei, which is a huge amount of energy that could solve our world energy problems. The problem is, is that we haven't gotten real good at it yet. So there's lots of inherent problems with nuclear energy. And a lot of it is the nuclear waste and coming up with the right reactants. Okay, let's check this out. This is what an example looks like. This is our previous example. You have a radioisotope nucleus on the reactant side. You have a product element that is more stable than the reactant. And you have an ejected particle that is being released. In this case, it is an alpha particle. Let's check out this flow chart. This flow chart is going to help us determine what kind of reaction we're looking at. So the first box says how many reactants. If there's only one reactant, then we know that it is a decay. So when you decide that there's only one element on the reactant side, you're going to say to yourself, this is a decay. Am I decaying to release an alpha particle or a beta part particle? There's other kinds of decays also, but we're not going to go into that in this class. If there's two or more, we know that that is not a natural decay. This is something where a projectile is being shot at an atom, so it's an artificial process happening in either a nuclear power plant or a lab someplace. The next box, after you decide there's two, you can say it's a larger element on the reactant side or the product side. So you have to compare the size of the elements. If the larger one is on the reactant side, then it's going to be split into two or more products. That's going to be a fission. A big one being split has an I in split and an I in fission. If the larger element is on the product side, that means that two smaller elements were united together and you might find some particles involved. The list of particles is not gonna be long for us. 
Let's go over an example. Flip your paper over on the other side. You'll see some examples. So let's check out this first example. How many reactants are there? One. So you're going to go down the one side, and the next box says, what particle is being emitted? Well, let's check out. we got to figure out what particle is there. We can see that there's 214 on the reactant side for mass and 214 on the product side for mass. So our particle is going to have a mass number of zero. Now look at the bottom. We went from 82 to 83. So that's going to tell you that the particle being released has to have a mass of zero and a charge of minus one because 83 minus one equals 82. What type of particle is this? That is a beta cut particle, so this is a beta decay. Remind ourselves, there's one reactant, so I know it's a decay. Now all I have to do is check out the product being emitted, and it is a beta particle, so it is a beta decay. Move to the second example. How many reactants are in this particular equation? Two. So now I got to say, is the larger element on the reactant side or the product side? What's the largest element involved in this equation? You're looking at the mass and the number of protons. What's the biggest? Oxygen. So we're going to go down the side that says the larger element is on the product side. So this is a fusion. So now we got to fit out, figure out what our missing product is. On the reactant side, our mass adds up to 17. So we know that our particle has to have a mass of one. The bottom's okay. We have eight on the reactants and eight on the products. So the particle has a mass of one and a charge of zero. What is that particle called? It is a neutron. And this is, we already decided, a fusion because boron and lithium are being united together to form oxygen. Okay, don't let this confuse you because my formatting is a little bit off. See, the 54 belongs to xenon. But we can see that there's two or more reactants. There's uranium and a neutron, so that's a reactant. What that means is the neutron is a projectile and we're bombarding uranium with it. So it is an artificial, not a natural decay. So we're gonna go down the two or more. Is the larger element on the reactant side or the product side? Well, you can see uranium is the largest element involved here. So it is the reactant side. This is a fission. This is an example of an equation that would happen in a nuclear power plant. So let's go over our adding up. Right now we have 39, 239 on the reactant side for the mass. We have 233 for the mass on the product side. So that means that we need six neutrons. The bottom on the reactant side is 92. The products is already 92, so that's how that works. So if you end up with a mass of six, but zero for the charge, you know you're dealing with neutrons. And this is a fission reaction. Okay, how many reactants do we have? One. So it's a natural decay. 
you're going to look that the particle has to contribute four for the mass and two for the charge. And we know that the particle that fits that bill is a helium nucleus. So that is our alpha particle. So this would be classified as an alpha decay. There are many more types of nuclear reactions, but we're not going to go over any more than this. You might see terms like electron capture. That simply means that an electron is one of the reactants. You might see terms like positron decay. A positron is a particle that exists, but we're not going to focus on. A positron decay is a positive electron, so it has a charge of plus one and a mass of zero. So just when you see those things, those are just things that we have, are not going to focus on here, but they are things that exist. This is what you're going to be held responsible for.